what ended up becoming uh, sorbane's oxide. I think that first bill actually was called uh, Corazine or something. So, um, And I remember uh, I had the honor of being on the floor of the U.S. Senate uh, staffing Chairman Sarbanes, and the, his colleagues asked John to sit in the presiding chair during the vote, if I recall it right. We thought, how could these two ex Goldman guys be here? But, uh, um, I also want to express my best wishes to John and Sharon, because tomorrow is his wedding day, if you did not know that. So, this is my I think something's changed in John's life because his idea of a bachelor party when he and I were both on a trading floor was kind of a bit different. <laughs> I'm not going to go any further there. I'm not going to go any further there. I'm also honored to speak with Andrew. Uh, he's been properly introduced, but all of us have followed your writing. It, it's, it's incisive, it's clear. Um, and I do look forward to, to the uh, movie Too Big to Fail, and I'm glad I'm not a character in it. Um, you asked me, I guess John laid this out, to talk about banks, shadow banks, in the face of Wall Street. And um, so for the purposes of this discussion, I thought I'd start just to define one term, financial intermediation. It, it covers all of these banks, shadow banks, and Wall Street. So to me, what financial intermediation, two key functions, uh, I didn't go to fancy Wilson School, but I sort of grew up in finance. So, uh, first, it's about allocating and pricing capital and money in the economy, and second, it's about allocating and pricing risk. So, capital and risk. So, banks and other financial institutions and the markets themselves perform this critical functions. They stand between those who have money and those who need money. They stand between those who have risk and those who are willing to bear risk. But as these needs don't always naturally align, and often they don't, banks and other financial institutions retain and manage many of these risks. They transform risks. They could be maturity risk, liquidity risk, credit risk. Um, you know, take for instance that households and corporations usually want to borrow money for long periods of time. Think of a 30-year mortgage. And yet those same households and corporations don't really want to lend for 30 years. They, they want their money back when they want their money back. So this is a basic mismatch, and this basic mismatch is an economy. It's in our economy as a whole, and thus it's in these financial institutions. I also thought that uh, I would take this moment as we approach the holidays to uh, talk about that wonderful classic, It's a Wonderful Life. As I see, you, you knew where I was headed. Uh, Jimmy Stork, how many in here have seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? All right, all right. I'm glad I was worried there was a few students that hadn't seen it. But. So Jimmy Stewart, of course, plays George Bailey. He runs the Bailey Building and Loan Association. Not technically a bank, but it's close enough. It, it provided those services. And in the movie, there was a run on the bank. You may remember as the, you know, the, the angels are looking back when, when George is like, there was the run on the bank, and George takes $2,000 that he and Mary were going to spend on the honeymoon. And he, he uses it to satisfy his depositors' needs and uh, restore confidence. Now, the movie was filmed in 1946, but the modern financial system struggles with that same inherent challenge of short-term funding when you think about what happens. And there remains this basic mismatch between depositors' desire to get their money on demand. That's why we call it demand deposits, by the way, because you can get the money on demand. And the bank's desire, of course, to deposit the money and lend it out for long periods of time. And you might remember one scene in the movie when George is trying to stem the tide of the run, and he tells his depositors, and I won't do it as well as Jimmy's story, but he says, quote, the money's not here. Your money's in Joe's house, and, and, and in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and a and hundred others. And he's trying to, to stem that tide with the rain coming down outside, and Mr. Potter's trying to take over the bank, the, the building and loan. So that's what's the same, but of course a lot has also changed. And thanks to some wonderful figures that are on the Federal Reserve's website, uh, the flow of funds. And John, you got me working this last weekend, so I did all this work. Uh, uh, I didn't staff this out to somebody. Uh, what you get me to do, I moved to Japan in this speech. <laughs> but uh, so back in 1946 compared to 2010, a couple of things. 
Back then, 98% of bank liabilities were actually deposits. Today, 63%. So banks are relying on other funding. Along the way, the banking se sector's gotten far more concentrated. Back then, in the 1940s, in fact, all the way through the 1970s, there were restrictions on branching and interstate banking. Today, the top 10 bank holding companies have $11 trillion in assets, two-thirds of the total. So you take the whole bank holdings, you know, two-thirds of the top 10. Total bank liabilities back in 1946, $152 billion. Um, now that sounds like a small number, it's actually about 70% of the debt economy. Total bank liabilities today, $14.7 trillion. That's about the size of the economy of 14 and a half trillion. So 70% to about 100%. But another thing's changed dramatically. Back then, the total credit in the whole system was 1.6 times the economy, and now it's 3.6 times the economy. We Americans borrow a lot more. We have a lot more leverage in the system today than we did back then. So banks, though larger, and though more concentrated, actually collectively make up a smaller piece of the overall pie. Thus, the title about shadow banking. And so one of the changes over the years is alternative ways that money and credit flows through the economy. Remember, I said there's two things that uh, the financial system does, intermediating credit and intermediating also risk. But there's a lot of alternative ways. The shadow banking system, or the alternative banking system, what is this? It could be money market funds. Many of us have a money market. In the old days, you would have had a deposit. But it's also things called asset back and mortgage securitizations, government sponsored enterprises. Those are the mortgages that George Bailey used to do. Now they're over there at, at Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac and things like that. Uh, there's also something called the repurchase or repo market, the securities lending market, and, and, and of course, commercial paper that's actually existed since 1869, but it's grown. Um, What's the total of all of this? You guessed it, more than the banking system, $16.4 trillion. And that actually leaves out four or five sectors I chose to leave out, but you could include them. Finance companies at $1.6 trillion. Securities brokers, nearly $2 trillion. $1.8 trillion in hedge funds. $1.5 trillion in private equity and venture capital. So, whether you measure it just the, the narrowest definition of 16 trillion or you add these other four or five categories together, you can get to one and a half times the banking sector in the shadow banking. Another key change is the significant growth in markets where one can buy and sell credit, one can buy and sell um, loans. Now this didn't exist as dramatically in George's time, but it existed even back to the 19th century. There was commercial paper, there were corporate bonds, but at George Bailey's time in 1946, they added up to about 18% of the total banking sector. So it was relatively small. But of course, today, the secondary markets, uh, usually the securities markets, uh, are pretty dramatic and pretty big. Now, they do help investors. There's good things, and financial institutions and investors can get liquidity, and they can get pricing, and what the economists surely here at Princeton would call a price discovery function where loans can be bought and sold, and that's a positive. So as I said, banking's changed a lot since George took his honeymoon money and stemmed that tie. They're far more concentrated, but there's a lot more uh, competing with banks. Uh, another change and another piece of the story it, uh, relates to um, significant changes on how the system also intermed intermediates risk. Um, and risk is intermediated in every time you do a loan. Uh, there is a risk that you might default, but also it's intermediated through something called derivatives contracts. Derivatives contracts, again, are not new. Wind all the way back before Lee surrenders in Virginia. A month before, and in Chicago, something called a futures started trading. Corn and wheat, farmers and grain merchants wanted to hedge the future price of a corn. They didn't have the corn at the time, they wanted to hedge it, and so the derivative contract, at least in this country, was invented even though they were uh, often elsewhere. By the 1970s, these futures contracts were expanded to financial futures, expanded to uh, 
energy markets. In fact, I think it's helped John Corzine, my partner, riding the, 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 the trade between futures and treasuries. It worked well. He was also very good at what he did, but it was a part of what he did at the time. Uh, but it was not until the 1980s that this thing called over-the-counter derivatives or swaps uh, started. In 1981, one, one of the investment banks, Solomon Brothers, arranged a trade between the World Bank and IBM. You see, IBM had some borrowings in Swiss francs and German Deutschmarks. And, and the World Bank wanted to borrow in those currencies, but they were limited. They were actually limited by the government of Switzerland from borrowing more in those currencies. So Solomon came up with a way, you might say they were skirting around the rules, but they came up with a way of, of swapping IBM's borrowings in Swiss franc and German DMARC for what the World Bank wanted, and that was the beginning of this thing called the swaps marketplace. It grew in interest rate swaps to allow people to hedge interest rate risk, and more recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, you're familiar with uh, the notable derivative called credit default swaps, where people are hedging against the risk of default in a swap. Derivatives are used by banks and the shadow banking system. They're used throughout the economy. Derivatives, uh, <coughs> particular currency swaps, interest in uh, spread swaps, and the CDS, the credit default swaps, are, are intertwined with the banking system. The banks are using them uh, uh, in, in, in all of their client businesses. Actually, based on some uh, government figures, the largest 25 banks have a total of $277 trillion of notional derivatives outstanding. To put that in context, that's 20 times their balance sheet. So if you take the average of those top 25 holding companies, every dollar on their balance sheet you can multiply by 20. Um, so we've moved away from George Bailey's uh, traditional banking. Uh, we, we see that uh, some benefits from it, but there's also big challenges. And 2008 highlighted those challenges. I think that probably most of you would agree the financial system failed the test, but also the financial regulatory system failed. Uh, they failed in part because I believe that the regulatory structures and systems we had didn't stay abreast of new forms of financial innovation. Um, Over-the-counter derivatives, for instance, were not regulated in the US, Europe, or Asia. <coughs> Derivatives, of course, were not the only cause of this crisis. Um, we experienced a housing bubble in this nation. But any study of the housing market, which is uh, the housing finance market, which is about 11 trillion in size, would certainly, I think, legitimately look at derivatives and say, what was the intersection? And there's a great intersection. Mortgage originators and others were able to use derivatives to actually originate loans, but have somebody else bear the various risks. And the banks and the shadow banking system both were involved in these innovations and the segmentation that was allowed through derivatives. They could segment what they're doing. Um, but the use of mortgage securitizations and credit default swaps, and yes, things called collateralized debt obligations, um, also led to risks. They thought that they broke up the risk. They thought that they broke them up and they let somebody else hold the risk. But there was a significant failure. And I think at the core, at the core, the failure was not understanding the relationship and correlations of the underlying risk and the products themselves. And not understanding in particular that there was a relationship to the overall value of housing. Now, if you think everything's going to keep going one way, then you feel pretty good about this. Um, but if you think not, the other way, the other thing they failed to see is the same thing that George Bailey had to deal with, was this basic mismatch between short-term funding and long-term assets. Nobody repealed that. That's, that's the same. That's the one thing that's the same. So derivatives meant to mitigate and help manage risk, I think actually helped heighten and concentrate risk. And the total uh, uh, in the banking system, to give you a sense even today, uh, those same top 25 banks we were talking about have about a trillion dollars of credit exposure on their books. And it's highly concentrated. The top five banks, 95% of that risk is in those five banks. Um, so instead of George Bailey's honeymoon money, that $2,000, it was uh, you and me, it was us, everybody in this room put up money. Uh, 
Uh, it's the taxpayers of the United States that have money, and in a sense, arithmetically, if you might, we each have $600 in AIG, because there's 300 million Americans. It's just math. Um, and that's what really stopped the tide this time. Um, and I think in the midst of this crisis, swaps contributed to a financial system that was so interconnected that institutions were not just too big to fail, they were, so to speak, too interconnected to, to be allowed to fail. So as John said, I'm honored to serve as the chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, we have swim in the derivatives lane. Since the 1930s, when President Roosevelt went to Congress in those days, the Securities and Exchange Commission oversees the securities markets, and the CFTC, the smaller agency, oversees the futures markets. In those days, it was just grains, but by now, as you follow the story, it's covering the whole derivatives and swaps markets. We're currently writing rules to implement the Dodd-Frank Act that passed this summer, and basically it's to bring the same reforms to the swaps markets that have been in place in the securities and futures markets for 75 years. Transparency with the standard derivatives trade on transparent platforms, uh, lowering risk through something called clearing houses, and making sure that dealers themselves are well regulated. Congress, I think, determined that it's incumbent upon regulators to update to the modern times, because we're certainly not living in George Bailey's time anymore. And I think that uh, we, we must oversee the banking system, the shadow banking system, the derivatives marketplace, and Wall Street to make sure that we stay as regulators abreast of the changes. I don't think we have the luxury to turn back the clock but we do have the responsibility to update our oversight for the financial system of our time and, and the financial system that we envision in the future. So with that, I thank you. Before I turn it over, I just also wanted to thank, uh, wish you a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> It's an honor for me to be here and to be on the stage with you. And John, thank you and congratulations in advance of the wedding. And thank you, Princeton, for, for having me. Um, a couple of quick thoughts, and then hopefully we can, we can turn this into a conversation and really open it up for questions. Uh, when I began working on my book, uh, Too Big to Fail, which really focused on 2008, if I had been honest about it, um, I would have started the book back in 1998. And you might say to yourself, why? Um, and really, the book should have begun, I think, uh, with long-term capital. Um, and the reason I raise long-term capital and the reason I raise it in the context of shadow banking is we oftentimes think of uh, the banking business as being the risky part of the business. But this all began, oddly enough, uh, more than a decade ago, uh, not in an investment bank, but at a hedge fund. And if you were to have gone back and uh, looked at the dominoes that were lined up then, not in September of 2008, but uh, back in, uh, in March, I believe, of, of 1998, you would have seen uh, that Bear Stearns was on the verge of falling uh, to pieces, and that Lehman Brothers was next, and perhaps Merrill, um, and then Morgan, and then Goldman. And so when you really think about where the risks lie in the system, uh, they're not always as obvious uh, as I think we all, we all think, and that's in fact why uh, I think in many respects we call this the shadow banking system. Uh, when Lehman Brothers fell apart uh, on September 15, 2008, uh, one of the great mistakes um, that the regulators, I, I, would, I would argue at the time, and I know Hank Paulson has, has taught at this class, one of, one of the, the great mistakes was not in focusing on the next dominoes. And in their minds, they were looking at potentially Marilyn Morgan and Goldman, et cetera. Um, but was actually the money markets. Um, another piece of the pie, another piece of the system that again should be considered part of the shadow banking system and, and indeed in the case of Lehman Brothers, uh, it was the fact frankly uh, that, that the money market uh, industry the world had actually bought so many Lehman Brothers bonds that were going bust and, and, and what that did in terms of breaking the buck and, and really undermining the confidence uh, that, that brought us to that horrific week of September 15th. Um, when you think of the next domino in line after Lehman, you saw Merrill, but of course the next domino after that was AIG. Again, an institution that historically I don't think any of us would have put in the quote-unquote banking category. Uh, 
and yet it was, uh, without, with all due respect to John and Goldman Sachs, and, and well, Gary also a former Goldman man, it, it was the great vampire squid in many respects. <laughs> Um, because it had its tentacles. You want to? You can rebut this if you'd like. But I, 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 it, it was because of, of, of something called CDS um, um, and this idea that, that they had been effectively offering insurance to all of these other banks. And so you really start to see how all of these things become quite connected. And then the last piece, um, you know, and I, I don't know if Hank went through this with everybody, but you know, inside the government that very week. The view, of course, was that Lehman would go, Merrill was going to be saved by B of A, Morgan Stanley was on the cusp, but Morgan Stanley went, then Goldman would go. But it was really the domino after Goldman that had people worried. And that was outside of the banking system, but really quite connected, which was GE, General Electric. That was, that was the ultimate worry, that, that, that this institution that we all think of that makes light bulbs and, and jet engines and, and toaster ovens, uh, was in trouble, and you might say, why? Because of something called GE Capital. And so I, I raise all these issues. I'm a reporter. I don't necessarily have answers, but I, I do hope that I can uh, ask some questions, or at least provoke you to ask some questions, to think about sort of where we should be, where we should be looking. Shadow banking ultimately is a very um, abstract concept. Um, it really means the corners of the financial world. Um, and, and unfortunately, sometimes we have to really get under the table uh, to see what that's all about. My biggest worry today, and to really sort of, I mean, Gary gave you some great numbers, but my worry today is actually about those very numbers and about some of the regulations that we've now put in place, many of which on the surface seem terrific. Um, you know, the Volcker Rule, I, I imagine people in this room uh, might have varying opinions on it, but ultimately the Volcker Rule you would think might make you safer. Well, it should make the banking system, the traditional banking system, safer. But ultimately, in many ways, it may push out some of the risks that the banks used to have, that ostensibly used to be regulated, even if they're badly regulated, um, into places uh, that are unregulated, into the shadows. Uh, one great example is actually that the, the, the Goldman, some of Goldman Sachs' uh, greatest proprietary traders uh, have now moved over to uh, KKR, for example. Uh, KKR is a private equity firm, or historically was a private equity firm that's now developing into a, a broader-based bank. Uh, some of their businesses are currently regulated, and some of their businesses may be regulated in the future, but in between, I'm not sure we will have a full accounting of where all of this money and fundamental risk is ultimately going. Um, two last pieces. Um, in a hopeful world, the Systemic Risk Council, uh, which to me is a key part uh, of the Dodd-Frank regulation, or Frank Dodd regulation <coughs> is, is this idea that this regulator can do everything, can be a superman, can actually see into all sorts of corners and into the shadows. Um, but ultimately, to me, as a journalist who's looking through these things, it, it's it's going to come down to the actual regulators on the ground. It's going to come down to the execution. And so we can have people in a council talking about the potential problems, but the, the, the real problems are lurking, are lurking beneath the shadows, uh, to use a uh, phrase of this, 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 this lecture. And, and to me, that fundamentally represents a, a problem. We may have some, a, a group that has great insight, or should have great insight, but their insight's only going to be as good as the regulators in this patchwork of regulators that's actually looking at all these issues. And I'm not sure, frankly, in all the cases, with the exception of this gentleman, uh, that, that all the regulators necessarily at this point are up to the task. Finally, um, when you think about crises, financial crises, and, and not to sell you another book, uh, but there's, there's another book out there called This Time is Different. Um, it's, it's an academic book, it's a great book, and it's worth reading if you have the time. Um, of course, the title is sarcastic, uh, because this time is never different. But while you can look at this particular financial crisis, and it has lots of fathers, and you could say it's housing policy, and Fannie and Freddie, and interest rates that were too low, and regulators that weren't minding the store, and bankers that have gone wild. But ultimately, it always comes back to one issue, and that's leverage, leverage in the system. Forget about everything else. It's a sideshow to, to one word, in, in my mind. And the reason I raise that is because ultimately all of these shadow banking 
areas and systems and things that we're going to be talking about today and I've just mentioned. That's what we need to be watching out for. It's that leverage. It's, you know, you can talk about too big to fail, the banks being too big to fail, but ultimately it's all of these pieces in the shadows which actually may ultimately be too, too, big, too big to fail. I hope that's not the case. I hope that's helped spark a little bit of conversation thought, and I hope we can now uh, take questions and open up to a conversation. So thank you. I'm going to kick it off with one question and then uh, we'll open it up to the crowd. Um, both of you have uh, focused uh, the uh, discussion on shadow banking into uh, the American marketplace. And uh, we pick up the paper today and there is a banking bailout in Ireland and, and ripple effects throughout Europe. Um, have, have our international regulatory authorities um, come to grips with the kind of challenges that, uh, let's say, I think you're doing more appropriately through the Oversight Council. Is that taking place in an international context in a way that gives us any, not that we, not that, I, that uh, Andrew is suggesting that we should have confidence in where we are today in our own regulatory structure, but I suspect that the kinds of numbers that you put forward, Gary, would be even more astronomical if you put it into a global context. And is there a real effort to coordinate uh, and are we moving in a satisfactory way along those lines? Is this work there? Yeah, yeah. you guys, please. Uh, John, I would say there's been tremendous, I've been at this just a year and a half in, in the job I'm in, but tremendous coordination uh, uh, in the regulatory side on capital, Basel III, which is this group that, that came together, I mean, in Basel, but it came the third time on capital. Uh, there's a lot of uh, compromises in a lot of ways on the capital side for banks, but it came together. I think at the leader's level, starting really under, even under President Bush, you know, at the, right in the midst of the crisis, 20 nations came together. They just met for the, I think it's the third time uh, for President Obama. And at that level, it's a key part of the conversation and, 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 and the agreements. With the European Commission and the US regulators, uh, very close coordination. For instance, on all that's been in dot frac on derivatives, uh, I would say we're not spot on because we're different cultures and different political systems, uh, but we're very close. And it is no doubt that just as when I was at firm of John, we would look for regulatory arbitrage. I don't think we called it that, uh, but that's what it's been called now. Maybe we're just calling it, we're going to efficiently use our capital and find out which legal entity to put it in. No doubt bankers today are looking, is it going to be better to put their capital to work in London or Singapore or Hong Kong and so forth. And uh, I'll finish by just saying capital and risk knows no geographic boundary. None. Uh, not in today's modern internet and electronics. So uh, what John's highlighted is it is absolutely critical that we have this coordination. <clears throat> I think it's going best with Europe. Uh, it, it's, it's been uh, going well with Asia, but it's most collaborative probably with Europe. Please. So I'm, can I, I just want to add, because I'm going to be a little less politic. Um, I, I, I'm not to suggest you weren't. But, um, but I was, I, I was a little, and you did very well. Um, <laughs> from what I'm seeing, um, I think sadly, there is more coordination. I, I don't want to dissuade you from the view that there, that there isn't more coordination, but I would also suggest to you that there clearly isn't enough. Um, I would personally argue, and, and, I, and I'm sure others may have a different view, that, our, that, that, that the Basel III uh, agreement, while uh, a step in the right direction, um, may not be enough. Um, to me, the European banks remain remarkably undercapitalized on a relative basis to the U.S. banks, and depending on uh, who you believe, the U.S. banks are still undercapitalized, including a report out this morning from Barclays uh, that suggested that they're going to need about $150 billion. That's the U.S. banks uh, just actually uh, 
uh, meet, meet the requirements as part of Basel III. Um, many of the issues that have, uh, have been agreed to as part of Basel, of course, don't apply or, or there hasn't been a conversation around some of the issues that we've talked about here um, when you start thinking about um, various parts and components of, um, of the quote unquote shadow banking system. Um, two issues I did want to raise around sort of this global arbitrage regulatory issue. Um, you know, again, on the local rule, which, which separates ostensibly the casino from the bank, um, we're doing that here. Um, that's not something necessarily that's being taken on elsewhere. And what does that ultimately mean? And then the last piece, and actually John and I were talking about this car on the, in the car, I think, on the, on the way up, is, you know, uh, there's a lot of people, and many people in this room may have the view that our banks in the U.S. are too big to fail. Uh, they're still too big, maybe they're too big to fail square, they're too big to manage, all of those things. Um, and yet, you, and, and we all think our banks should be smaller, we'd be in a better place if they were smaller banks. But when it comes to global coordination, that's actually the other piece of it, which is we talk about safety and stability in this country, and that's all well and good, but I'm not sure how we're all going to feel if in five or ten years from now China has banks that are three times the size of J.P. Morgan, and the next time General Electric needs a $20 billion loan instead of going hat in hand to 20 different banks in the U.S., they call it the Chinese bank. And so these are the issues when you talk about global arbitrage or regulatory arbitrage that I think we need to, to figure out. Uh, sadly, maybe this is not going to sound politics, I'm not from New Jersey, I'm from New York, where you know, the folks in the city don't seem to get along very well with the folks in Albany. So I have very little hope, frankly, that we're actually going to get to a place where we're actually going to have a, a, a global regulator or some type of real global agreement that actually addresses all of these issues anytime soon. Sorry to depress the room. <laughs> with that encouraging remark, let's open it up, please. You all haven't been shy in previous weeks, so let's go ahead. So I have two factual questions. I feel a little bit um, awkward for asking them, but it would greatly help me understand the issues a bit better. One, I guess, um, why was AIG, AIG surely could not have been the only underwriter of these CES contracts. What happened to the other guys? Did they, were they bailed out or were they, uh, did they just die out or was simply AIG really the main seller of these contracts? And, and, and then two, um, what is the legal force of, of the Basel agreements? Are they, um, are they sort of official treaties? Do they, are they legally binding? Does anyone have a sense of what um, obligation they've created? I actually don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to the second question at all. I complete, complete ignorance. Is there a legal? Um, uh, I swim in a derivatives lane and I'm not a bank right. regulator. But um, uh, as, as I understand them, there has been an agreement which was then uh, supported by the G20 leaders that just met as well. And so, in, in essence, there, it become, it, they need to be adopted by each home state regulator. So the Federal Reserve and the bank regulators here to have, it, to have the force of law here does have to be adopted. Yeah. Uh, but since they're the ones that negotiated it, you know, every anticipation. But, but it doesn't have, it's not a treaty that goes to the U.S. Senate or something like that. It has to be adopted by regulators. Um, and it's Basel III is at the holding company level, and many of these holding companies are, it's about international coordination. And your question number one, uh, AIG was just the largest. Uh, they had in total a two point, I think, a little over $2 trillion derivatives book, but actually their credit default swap book was only about 20% of that, about $450 billion. And when you study it even more closely, it was only one portion of the book, but a $70 billion portion of the book, it was just disastrous. And this were the credit default swaps that they were writing on um, these various mortgage securitizations. To answer your question, there were a number of others that were doing it. Sometimes they were doing it called bond insurance. A couple of them, parts of them went bankrupt. MBIA, if I remember, <coughs> AMBAC. Um, 
There were, I mean, it's, it's remarkable for me in this job, sometimes they're coming trooping into our offices now because they're wondering, they're either in trust, not AMVAC and, and MBIA. There were about eight to 10 others. Yeah. Most of them uh, uh, all had similar problems. A few had to be bailed out. There was a huge uh, set of trust vehicles in Canada actually had some, had some support and they had to set up a separate vehicle. Um, but AIG was most dramatic because it was so interconnected with the rest of the financial system. It was renting their balance sheet and their credit rating, their triple-A credit rating. And most of the first money, or nearly two-thirds of the first money that we all put in went straight through AIG to other financial institutions. It was this interconnectedness. But why, why the concentration? Like, why did they end up with all that, all these toxic you know, securities or toxic insurance? These payouts they have. I, I think, and beyond Andrew's books, there will be lots of books written on it. I think because they were so large and they had a triple A rating okay. that um, European banks and US banks uh, were basically willing to not only rent their name, but not have uh, what I would consider appropriate collateral arrangements. Gary, let me, let me see if I can interject here just a little bit. First of all, it was a bad business decision. AIG decided that it would write insurance policies against primarily uh, these uh, mortgage derivative structures. And they didn't do what would be prudent, which is in the banking system, a requirement that reserve requirements be set aside against um, your liabilities. Yeah. Uh, there are no regulators insisting that there be any um, um, marginal requirements. So, so one of the debates you will hear among a lot of folks is naked shorting shouldn't be allowed to occur. You know that you either have something on the other side or at a minimum you end up putting up margin. And Gary's in the thick of this because now all of the uh, themes within Dodd-Frank and frankly more broadly across the world are to create exchange-traded, i.e. Uh, transparent prices and clearing arrangements with regard to instruments like AIG was putting forward and therefore with margin or reserve requirements not really reserved, but margin requirements uh, and mark to market processes that if things go up and down, which didn't go on with AIG's portfolio, they just stayed naked, uh, exposed, and then when the party stopped, uh, they didn't have the money unless uh, we taxpayers put it in to give to other folks. Now there were some bilateral arrangements that get written about where people were asking for margin but there were debates about what the prices were. It's actually really one of the hard, it, 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 is, it is a discussion that is at the heart of how you can make the system safer. And the theme within Don Frank is to use the system that has been around since 1800 or 1850 or whatever Gary talked about, to put it together in the futures market like arrangement with mark to markets and transparency of prices. You know, the other thing about AIG was, AIG was an insurance company, it was regulated as an insurance company in many parts, and then they set up an affiliate that was in Connecticut and London, and that affiliate was basically got a pass. It wasn't regulated by the insurance regulators, and though it should have been regulated, maybe at the top, <coughs> consolidated regulators, the office of thrift supervision. It was a very effective thing. Hi. So my question is that uh, given the size and the fragility of the shadow banking system, particularly because of the exposure to runs by wholesale funding providers, do you think that the, they should have access to official backstops on a permanent basis like the Fed liquidity facilities? Or do you think that they should be regulated out of existence? Like <laughs> forcing banks to be the only two choices? <laughs> Those are the two main choices. You can come up with the third one. Yeah. <laughs> well, give you the other choice is just ultimately to, to regulate the leverage issue. I mean, it always comes, as I said, it always comes back, it always comes back to leverage. And so 
to me, it doesn't mean that you have to regulate them out of business. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you have to give them unlimited access to capital, effectively. Um, you just need to actually control at some level what they do. And the question is, are we as, a, as investors, as the public, are we prepared to do that? Um, I don't think we've gotten there yet, right? at least politically, uh, to go there. And I suspect, though, given the anger of just traveling around uh, from what you hear, everybody's quite angry. I actually suspect you may get there. Um, but, but I don't think we, we focus on it. There's a lot of issues we haven't dealt with in this last piece of legislation as important as it was. You know, I would just add to Andrew's point on leverage. Uh, this year, right now, we're about 306, say $3.6 dollars of debt for every dollar in the economy. 360% if you wish. And in George Bailey's time, we were 160%. But you know what? Through the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, about 150 to 180%. Through most of the 1990s, it started creeping up to the 200%. We have, as a nation, have taken on significant leverage, three and a half dollars to every dollar in the economy. Do you want to know the last decade we did this? Does anybody want to raise their hand and get good students here? Why? We saw it. It's a lecture. 1929. The last time we had this amount of leverage was in the late 20s. So I just have to associate myself with the <laughs> Do you think it's true, I mean, to both of you, that um, people, even at high levels, just didn't understand the financial innovations that were driving the bubble and crisis? And then, if, if it's true that, uh, that really the, the innovation got ahead of um, everyone's ability to, to comprehend it, how does that change your job as reporter and regulator? There's, there's two pieces to this. Um, yes, I think that in some cases things got too complicated. But I would also uh, contend that in some cases uh, the problems of the crisis were quite simple. Uh, if you look at Lehman Brothers, for example, uh, why did Lehman Brothers go bust? Lehman Brothers bought real estate. They bought shopping malls and buildings at the worst possible time. These were, these were not things that were hard to understand. Um, you could have bought them if you had enough money. Um, you just had to buy them at the right time, and they, did, they didn't. Um, on the second piece, though, I think there is clearly an issue, and it goes back in my mind to this idea of too big to manage, which is that these institutions have grown to, be, to have thousands of products, uh, hundreds of thousands of employees, and they're across the world. This isn't Starbucks. This is not a one-product company. And I think there's a real question as to whether investors, or what investors and what the public thinks uh, should be the responsibilities of the CEOs, the managements, and the boards to actually understand everything that's going on. Um, if you spend time with the board of GE to take it out of the banking world, for example, I think they sell 24,000 different products. Um, there's a 12-person board. Do we expect them to, to understand all of the, the intricacies of their business? In truth, probably not. But trust me, when there's a problem, we will. Um, and, and this is one of the issues that I think we need to, to grapple with. Having now interviewed and spent you know, 500 plus hours uh, interviewing people for this book, I would tell you that most of the CEOs that I spent time with probably didn't fully understand their businesses. I would argue they don't understand their businesses completely today. Uh, does it make them bad people? No. But, I, but I'm not sure even the smartest of them could understand the, the, the full complexity of business. Having said that, and it goes back to the beginning of what I was talking about, and Lehman's a different, different case, but all these businesses, as complicated as they were, as long as you understood how much leverage you had, which we're talking 30 to 1, whatever, to me, that's the only number you needed to know. Was the, that was the problem. <coughs> Everything derived from that. So. Uh, there's other questions, so I'm just going to say, I think that the regulatory system did fail, and it failed to stay abreast of the developments. Um, in the one area that I've spent the most time on derivatives, I think the complexity was misunderstood, and, and derivatives were meant, again, to lower risk, mitigate risk, and in fact, uh, didn't do that in the mortgage market at all. So 
But I think that was misunderstood probably at the highest levels of these financial institutions as well. Um, uh, aren't there still a huge amount of securitized mortgages which have no value, whatever, has been established, and aren't they considered part of the assets of the banking system now? And to what extent <coughs> will their final uh, market values affect the whole banking system? I don't, I don't know the full number, but unfortunately, I think something in the order of 11, maybe a million people in, in this country still live in homes that are worth less than their mortgages. They're underwater. And, and, and that's a terrible place to be for those families and those individuals, but it's also weighing down on the economy and weighing down, as you said, on these mortgages. And of course, we have the whole issues that I'm not close enough to on mortgage foreclosure and, and, and the valuations. So I think you're, you're right that there's many mortgage securitizations uh, that are still weighing down on the banks, um, and the market is not um, you know, yet um, sorted that through. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it could take uh, a number of years and weigh down our economy far too long. Um, but I don't know. <coughs> that issue, by the way, is at the heart of what is the Irish uh, problem currently. Uh, there was a sense that there had not been a full mark-to-market or a stress test of the balance sheets uh, of the Irish banks. Sovereign was uh, financed and, and presumed to be uh, secure in and of its own right, except that it was preparing to guarantee all of the liabilities of their private banking system. And so um, that issue, certainly in Ireland, I think you'll probably hear among other European banks, and maybe even one day in the United States, um, that the marketplace, the bond vigilantes, may at some point test whether uh, those stress tests that we've read so much about, not properly marked to market, uh, the mortgage and commercial mortgage assets on banks. It generally happens when some other event is occurring. But that's, that, that is one of the questions that any risk manager uh, has to ask about the balance sheet of your counterparties that you're doing business with, whether it's a sovereign nation, or it's a bank, or it's some of those shadow banks. Well, uh, I guess my question is how, how do the banks now handle the asset value of these almost junk bond status mortgage securitizations, how are they doing? Is it, is it at some unrealistic leveraged value that could uh, really affect us in the future? I would argue my understanding is that most of them act, have actually been finally marked down. That's, that's the good news. The question is are they marked down enough, which is, and, and the real question then becomes, if, if the housing market still has a ways to go, we have a problem. Right. I'm not sure, I don't know at this point whether they're marked unrealistically. Do you believe they're marked unrealistically? I'm paid not to have a view on that right now. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm swimming in my lane, I'm not trying to make news. Um, but I think that what's weighing on this economy and weighing ultimately on the banks, but I'm more worried about the homeowners. There's 11 million homes that are under value. And, uh, and we have nearly 10% unemployment. And, and so it, it doesn't, it's not in isolation. It's, it, it's about the economy overall and jobs too. Um, and uh, so the longer we stay in this very difficult economy, uh, I think uh, the more challenged it is for, for the valuations you're talking about. Can I ask one quick question myself of both of you? Which is, do we think that mark to market was a good thing or helped contribute to this crisis? <clears throat> I'm a big believer in the to market and transparency in the crisis uh, as much as possible. And while it is painful 
when it happens, once you're on a regimen of the market to market, not when uh, you have to deal with the problem like the gentleman brought up to right. have a shock treatment that recognizes the loss one one point in time. But if you do it on an ongoing basis, it makes the system a lot more secure. And uh, but do you think the move? To, I guess the, the question is, do you think the move in 2007 helped precipitate the crisis? Not, not to suggest philosophically. Aggravated. Aggravated. But, but see, I think the question here for those who aren't familiar is our accounting systems uh, for centuries have at the, had the, at the core uh, historical accounting. Somebody buys that chair, you know, you put it in the books at whatever it costs Princeton to buy this chair. And then you depreciate it on some arithmetic basis. Um, in the 1960s, mark, the market accounting started in a number of way, ways in places. It, it, uh, and it was actually a very good thing in mergers, because I know you report on mergers in the late 60s, they started market, market accounting there. By the last decade or two, it started very much in other areas. I, too, uh, think that market, market accounting is very important because it gives investors, and ultimately accounting is about protecting the investors in a company, investors a real view as to what's happening in these financial institutions. It's not appropriate for Princeton buying that chair, and so you have to decide which assets it's appropriate to. And I think in the same way in the banking system, it may not be appropriate for a, a whole loan, but it may very, be very important for the securities they have. So, and often market market accounting is raised in these debates because it can be pro-cyclical when times are bad. You know, George Bailey is trying to stem the tide, uh, the, the accounting goes down. But regulators can adjust. It doesn't mean regulators have to be doing the same thing as, uh, as for investors. So, I want to ask any more questions. <laughs> Thank you for both being here. I'm a commodity broker, and 30 years ago in Chicago, Farmers were bringing their tractors right, right down the sale street and saying, there's no economic benefit this year, really shaping us with lower farm prices. But anyway, I still maintain that future markets have a place there's an economic justification. Um, I was going to ask you about the CFTC and uh, if the prescription, if that Franks is a good prescription, does the CFTC at this point have the teeth to wipe? regulations that would be effective to reduce the gaming system, or are there certain you know, political lobbyist pressures that would like you to comment generally? But one quick comment about mark to market One of the issues with mark to marketing for a firm that would do a deal over the counter, a non-exchange trade, is they were pretty much able to value that chair, for instance, at any price they chose, to, as long as it was sort of close to where an exchange traded, instrument of the same value was uh, evaluated. So I'm not sure if mark to, mar if mark to market, which I do believe in, there's just too much grade for companies that even need to strictly do mark to market. Uh, they don't work just in the, the CFTC. So, so the question is, is, does a little agency like the CFTC, there's 688 people, just, uh, you didn't put in a little agency, but I have. Uh, <laughs> a little agency like the CFTC, have the uh, resources, and you said the teeth, uh, to, to do what's needed. I, I think so. Um, it's a great agency. I mean, the, the expertise in the agency is very good, and everybody's very focused because there was this crisis in 2008. Nobody wants that again. Um, Congress has given us explicit direction, and the core of Dodd Frank in our minds is transparency. That that take this. $300 trillion market out of darkness and bring it into some light. It's not 100% of it, but transparency economists over decades have shown is a positive to markets. It brings competition in markets. It also lowers risk in markets because more people can see where the pricing is in those markets. And I think investors and corporations hedging can get you know, better access. Um, it does tip some of the information advantage from the dealers to the corporations who use it, and ultimately to all of you as customers. I think we'll be able to write the rules on transparency. I think we'll be able to write the rules on the clearing houses and the other things we need to write the rules on, and um, my fellow commissioners are committed to it. Um, the real challenge is, is this little agency is also under <coughs> a continuing resolution. 
We have only the funding that we had last year, and we have inflation, and we have salary increases, and things like that. And we think we need 400 more people to take on markets that are seven times the size of the markets we oversee now. We think we need 400 more people to take on three to 400 new dealers and swap execution facilities and things like that. Uh, we think we need 400 more people to protect against the risks that were in the markets in 2008. And, uh, but we have this reality that we have a terrible budget deficit in this country and Congress has to come together on a budget and that's probably not going to give us the 400 people because uh, we only ask for it over two years anyway. Um, so that's the real challenge. And, and there, will, there will be a problem next summer if we don't get funding. I enjoyed the analogy with It's a Wonderful Life, although uh, from my perspective, it seems like uh, Mr. Potter eventually uh, won over. So in the sequel, I think it will be Potterville. Um, <clears throat> I'm one of those skeptics about financial innovation. It seems to me, and I'm not in the industry, but it seems to me that uh, the beneficiaries are primarily Wall Street and investors. I don't see the beneficiaries being American industry or the so-called guy on Main Street. I'm wondering two things. First, if we could ever have uh, regulation to keep up with financial innovation. Just as you said, I don't think it's possible. I think there'll always be another innovation that's going to, you know, it'll take years before the government can never keep up with it, and you'll just, you won't have a, ever have a budget large enough to manage that process. And my big worry, and uh, the second question, really has to do with sovereign debt crises. A small example is what's going on in Ireland. They're now going to borrow roughly $100 billion from the ECB. It's just putting the problem off to the future. I could see them coming up with austerity measures and having smaller uh, you know, a smaller economy and never being able to pay off that debt. So it looks like the next problem is going to be a sovereign debt crisis. So I'd like to... Andrew's agreed to take your second question. Uh, I think it's... Uh, your name is... Uh, Tim Bell. So Tim's... I think Tim's uh, uh, put his finger on a very real challenge. And um, it's hard uh, for uh, government officials to stay uh, ahead or even abreast of all innovations. It's true in the airline industry, it's true in the oil industry, uh, it's true in autos, it's true in most every industry. So it's not unique, but in the financial industry, it's uh, much more dangerous. It, 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 is, it is a challenge, and as Tim has said, it can be uh, dangerous to our economic well being. Um, uh, so I think it's incumbent upon regulators to stay abreast. I think that we have to update our laws. And even through this council, I'm honored to be a member. We have our second meeting tomorrow, um, so I'll take back whatever people want. Um, uh, to stay, stay abreast, uh, of, and sometimes, unfortunately, it takes a major crisis uh, that to get new authorities, uh, and, and that's part of our political economy, that if things work that way. Um, I think we're benefited by terrific career folks and then I think we're benefited for people like me that cycle in and out. You know, that, 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 that the tops of these agencies are presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed folks that hopefully come from academia and industry and they're farmers sometimes or they're folks like me who came from Wall Street. Um, but it's a, I agree it's a very real challenge. On the, on the kicking the can down the, down the road issue, um, I think we are kicking the can down the road. In Europe, by the way, I would argue we're kicking down the can down the road here. Uh, you know, when I wrote the book, Too Big to Fail, I think we only talked about it in the context of financial institutions. Now we talk about it in the context of countries and, and municipalities. Um, in truth, however, I'm not sure um, what you would actually want to do in Ireland. I think you would have to rescue them. I, mean, there is I think Ireland should have let the banks fail. Well, but I, I, think, that, I think there's a real issue um, about what's politically palatable and what's acceptable for a country um, and what the ramifications of letting the, the banks fail would mean to the economy long term. And so I think there are these moments where you have to flood the zone with money, otherwise it's too painful. Now, one of the things I've raised in this country is that you know, everybody here I think probably agrees that we need to have an adult conversation about our own costs 
in this country, our own austerity measures. And yet, in truth, um, when the Deficit Commission uh, came out just a week and a half ago, and people talked about raising the Social Security age by two years, you know, 70 years from now, or whatever the, the, the duration was, you know, uh, people said, we can't do that. That's impossible. We can't do these things. So I'm not really sure that as, as much as we say we want to have this adult conversation, that this adult conversation is taking place. And, and how are we going to get there is, is frankly uh, an issue of, of leadership and, and people like uh, John and Gary and, and others uh, taking these hard issues on. But, you know, people talk about uh, uh, personal responsibility in this crisis and others. Ultimately, we, we all, everyone in this room is going to have to take some kind of responsibility for some of these things. Um, and, and I think maybe I'm hoping some of the younger people here want to, not to suggest the older people don't, but, it's, it, but the voters who are the older people actually don't want to take uh, responsibility for these issues because, in truth, for them, they're kicking the can down the curve to the next generation. You can, please. I'm sorry. Um, okay, I have this in my head. Um, war. Um, we say 1929, and then came the 30s, and then came. Suppose there were World War III. What would you say about the topic today? Would you say there was any um, relevance to its causation? I don't. Uh, we have um, a. Well, all right. The Times did a wonderful interactive feature last week where we could all. Um, do our own budget. Yes. Right. And the reason I just blurted that out is because the old people, mm -hmm. such as myself, um, all said, we don't want wars. We don't want all this military stuff. Right. Um, and that's one way to, to get this way, way down. Okay, so, I don't know. I, I don't really have anything to ask. It's just a time of fear and has the sense that the what's happening to the economy is going to end in a crisis or a new or something. Right, John, I don't have to be a moderator. Do you want to speak to the inequality? <laughs> One of the things that we have been talking about periodically during this series of, of uh, conversations uh, that I started off with is that there are very big imbalances in our system that go well beyond the subject matter of the, the, the context of the financial system itself. Um, the biggest one, in my view, which, by the way, leads to social unrest in a country. Uh, by the way, you can have social unrest among countries as well when there are economic disturbances. But we have seen since the 1970s the middle class of America not have one cent of real income growth. Uh, and in that period of time, families went from one adult working to two adults working to two adults working one or two jobs to ultimately borrowing against their homes and everything else that they own so that they could maintain a standard of living. Meanwhile, um, those of us who've been blessed with good fortune of operating in the top 5% of income have seen that grow disproportionately. And so you end up, whether it's Tea Party movements or unease that develops in a society, because of inequalities. It happens among nations as well. And some of the debate that we're having among emerging markets in the United States as we go through various policies right now do create instabilities. I don't think they're going to create a war personally, but um, they ultimately could if they carry it to an extreme if you're stress testing. So I think the question, or at least the observation, is real. There is serious. I mean, if you're in Greece right now, people don't like the adjustment process that's being forced. In the United States, we just say, well, hell, we'll vote out anybody that says they want to raise the retirement age on Social Security. But in Greece, that's being imposed by outside folks. 
that gets too broad, then you end up with broad social unrest and you see a lot of other changes. I think is the only thing I can say to that. Sir? All right. Let's assume that you write a wonderful set of rules and the government gives you the budget to hire the people that you need in order to regulate the financial markets in this country. What can you actually do to prevent people who don't want to be regulated from moving to Nigeria or Dubai or some other place where they can buy the government to let them do whatever they want? Um, uh, excellent question. The agency that I'm so honored to lead, it's just one area, derivatives. We don't have the whole financial sector. But um, the uh, folks in Congress provided that if you wanted to enter into these transactions with anybody in the US, we get to have some oversight over it. Uh, so if it's in uh, Nigeria or Dubai and they're dealing with people in Nigeria or Dubai, that's not, not over. But if it's an international uh, large bank or something and they're dealing with somebody in Kansas or New Jersey, uh, then it comes under the act. So we're spending a lot of time back to an earlier question with the uh, laying out uh, what arrangements we want to have with European and Asian regulators because some of these large banks are in Europe and Asia dealing with U.S. customers in these derivative marketplaces. But uh, Congress was, I think, wise in giving us some oversight on it, as long as it's got a connection to U.S. commerce. Um, now that doesn't mean risk can't come out elsewhere, um, but but I mean in terms of if it's got a connection to U.S. commerce, we're, we're able to um, write rules around the derivatives business. Yeah, the the great strategic question probably is not Nigeria or Dubai, but whether the rules and the enforcement of the rules, the rule of law, and transparency. And and, uh, and uh, the reserve requirements, if you will, uh, evolve in what is now the second largest economy in the world. Um, they are developing very, very sophisticated um, derivative markets, very large concentrated banking markets in China um, that has enormous width and breadth of participation in the global economy. Um, and I'm not saying this as criticism. I think it's good. Uh, more people come out of poverty in the last 25 years than any time in the history of mankind. And it's good that that has happened. But you have, it's one thing to freeze out Dubai, and it's another thing to freeze out uh, a country with great strategic throwaway like China. And so getting those rules Coordinated, and I noticed that uh, the chairman said you have pretty good coordination with Europe, and you know there's efforts in other parts of the world, but in our developing world, let's leave it out, individuals, there is less coordination on less things like currency regimes and other things that could give you pause that the system won't be coordinated well enough over a period of time. Let me say, some people have raised this issue of uh, regulation, and we're doing our best to get it harmonized around the globe. It will not be totally harmonized. One, because of different cultures and politics. But two, there will be some countries that aren't, uh, don't desire to be included in whether it's derivatives regulation or others. And, uh, but I don't think that's a reason we should act here. I mean, I think we have to protect our, our public and our economy as best we can. Well, that's certainly right. So. The question is, do you actually have a, a way to control things that go on in other places in the world? No, there isn't. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think it's hard enough just here. But uh, I do think that, and, and, and John's right, I mean, we've been collaborating with, even at the CFTC, 15 or other 15 to 20 other countries uh, directly with the European, it's 27 countries in one unit. Uh, so we've been doing our best, but uh, no doubt some are, you know, will decide to participate. Some will do it. Japan moved before us, actually. Uh, they put in place in May derivatives law, which is actually pretty strong. So, um, you know, people will give up in different ways. Sir? 
Yes, and uh, <coughs> I need to bring up the subject of electronic trading, but I know you're interested, in Mr. Gessler. Um, there's a lot of concern about it, because I know a lot of people that, that are involved with the stock market as investors, and it disturbs the stock market tremendously. And one particular part of it seems very easy to handle. Uh, now we have flash trading, this instant stuff, where they sell 5,000 stocks short in a second. And I thought, and they don't own these stocks, I thought selling naked shorts is illegal. And why don't we stop it? You know, if I were a regulator in this country, I would stop it. Why are they allowed to sell naked shorts? Can you answer that? You know, I have to be careful not to make news. Um, uh, so it, it, two, two questions. One is about short selling in the securities markets places. Um, I think that's what your question is about. And two is about technology and rapid trading. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to the Securities and Exchange Commission on short selling, but I do believe that their rules are that you have to, um, I can't remember how many days you have, but you. You, you can't have a fail to deliver. You do have to be able to uh, uh, provide the security and borrow the security. Uh, so I don't know if that directly answers your question about this. The naked shorts means you're selling something you don't own. It's very different in the futures marketplace. The fundamental functioning of futures markets, all the way back to the 1860s, is that speculators are not only allowed, but they're very much a part of the marketplace. A, a, a grower of corn or wheat wanted to sell it to somebody who didn't necessarily even want delivery. And there were people on the other side that would sell the corn or wheat, even though they never owned it. So, so this concept of naked shorts is very much a part of the futures market and it helps the functioning of that marketplace. The, the, uh, but in the securities marketplace, I believe you have to have a, a you can't have a fail to deliver. There are, there are, there are new instruments, though, ETFs and CFPs and single stock futures and options on, on stocks that allow for that, that are occurring that make the market much more complicated. I, I was going to add one thing about technology. I truly don't believe any of us can turn back technology. John and I first met, there was really no internet. I think it was, what, 1986 when the ARPANET became, you know, when we started, and it was really the 1990s before you had any electronic trading at all. In the last 10 years, it took off quite a bit. Um, we at the CFTC and at the SEC are looking very closely. This is a, back to an earlier question. There's a big change in markets. Those people that used to be on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, if any of you go to the New York Stock Exchange now, it's a shadow of what it once looked like. Or if you go to the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, they'll pit traders in the New York Mercantile Exchange. Um, most of that, not all of it, is moved into computers. And we can't turn that back necessarily. But it does change the whole environment and the high frequency traders uh, uh, now make up significant portions of the market. In some it's at estimates, over half of the volume of the market. And so we're looking at ways to best protect the market uh, in the realities of these uh, new days. But I don't know if Andrew has something. I would only comment on the short selling uh, issue, which I think it's a real issue. I think it's uh, always been a real issue, and it really is illegal, and yet I would also uh, agree with you, sir, that unfortunately it, is not, it has never been enforced by the SEC uh, as well as it should. If you actually look at, at the fail, fail to delivers, even around the financial crisis and other, I mean, just with frequency, um, it's just something that for some reason the SEC historically, uh, these were Christopher Cox and earlier, it was something that they did not uh, enforce. Um, I don't know under the new leadership whether they plan to pursue this or not. Um, one other part of this, I understand you are thinking about that maybe they ought to tax, add a new tax. Is that true? I read that about, uh, about you. I, 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 have been, I have an identical twin brother. It could have been. <laughs> I, I, I'm not involved in tax policy. Apparently, some of the people are thinking of taxing these. So. Anyway. Ma'am, I think this will be the last question.
plus What do you think will happen to the implementation of the Dodd-Frank bill and also the consumer uh, credit uh, agency uh, in the next Congress, particularly with the heavy lobbying now and with uh, the large Repub well, the Republicans uh, dominating the House? Well, you know, to, to me, the Consumer Protection uh, Bureau is, is perhaps one of the critical and central elements of that legislation. And, is one of those dominoes that if, if you could have fixed earlier, it maybe would have prevented the crisis. Um, there's clearly already a lot of pushback on, on the Bureau. I don't believe the Bureau is going anywhere. I think the issue is ultimately going to be on the oversight of how the Bureau is, is ultimately run, who runs it, um, and, 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 and effectively um, how, and this goes to an Elizabeth Warren issue, the kind of direction that it takes from the beginning. Um, and I think that to the extent that the Republicans are able to um, stymie uh, the efforts at really trying to have some type of strong leader there, uh, try to have some kind of oversight council or do something else, uh, I think that, that the Bureau will have less teeth. Um, I think by default the Bureau will probably have less teeth. But I, I think unto itself the Bureau, by existing, um, should actually in, unless is, they're as incompetent as the SEC was uh, during the last decade, um, just by existing, if, if they even do half their job, um, we as consumers should actually be much happier and better, better off people. Yeah, I, I would just say we'll, we will continue at the Arab Agency to work with Congress on funding. I think that's the key issue for us. I think Congress passed a strong law as it relates to these markets, these over-the-counter derivative marketplace, and uh, though there'll be pushback from the big financial players, uh, I think that uh, we're going to continue, we're going to write these rules, we're supposed to do it by July uh, 15th of next year, uh, there's about 235 more days if I keep count of this thing <laughs> before we have to finish this, and uh, we, uh, I think we're on a good track to, to, to do the, that, but the funding will be a big issue. And we live in a great democracy. I, I have to make, and the President ultimately has to make our case that for this funding, but I think it's clear because 2008 was a real crisis. The American public do not want this to happen again. They want the transparency in these markets. Even if they don't understand the markets, they know they're too dark right now. And even if they don't understand the markets, they know they're too risky right now. And it was ultimately the taxpayers that did what George Bailey had to do and put their money into these banks. So I would hope that we would be able to get the funding. Join with me in uh, celebrating. Tonight we'll have our concluding uh, uh, speaker, lecturer, if you will, Paul Boker, and I presume we will be in this room. Thank you.